Good morning. Good morning. Uh, it's been a while since I've been here, guys. It's good to see your smiling faces in the middle of summer. How did y'all weather the weather the last couple of weeks? Anybody lose some trees? Nothing like that? Well, Temple got whacked. And uh, as I was sharing with the gentleman earlier, uh, my wife and I had the experience of a tornado just going right down our street. Not on the ground. Praise God. Just enough to knock down nine of our 60-foot trees. We loved our trees. And we lost them. It was so shaded. But whereas I could not ever grow flowering plants because there was shade all over the place, now I have full bloom. And so with, with the darkness came light and with the light came beauty. And so all is well. Nobody got hurt. And we didn't lose anybody in, in, in Temple from that. And uh, everybody's doing a really good job of cleaning things up over there. Uh, and those of you who can remember me, yes, I did not go to the barber since I've been here. As you can see, we're pulling it back, and it's my hairline's receding really hard. Some of you all understand what I'm talking about. But uh, today we're going to continue in the series on the character of God. Uh, 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 dear Pastor Scott stuck me with the anger one. <laughs> It'll, payback's going to be horrible. <laughs> payback will be horrible. But we're going to be talking about anger, the anger of God today and uh, how that has to do with us, a little bit on that. One little bitty note that they, they told me is that next week is gonna be Unity Sunday. For those of you who like to get up nice and early, go to church and get home and have a whole day with the family, you get to come to a, a united service. And so I think it's gonna be in the middle, correct? Uh, 9.30, which is a good time. Everybody can scrape off the barnacles by that time. And so be sure to come come and see those folks that go to that other service. And then y'all can have some fun afterwards. Uh, we'll begin our worship this morning with a wonderful song. We all know that it's one of my favorites. Oh, worship the king. And when we get to that last verse, we've got verse 1, 4, 5, and 6. When we get to verse 6, let us stand on that one, okay? Sisters, we have come to worship in the name of the one true God, the Father, 
who created us. us. In the name of Jesus Christ. Who In the name of the Holy Spirit. Glory be to you, O oh God, the, the Savior, Savior of all, forever and ever. Amen. As we come to the Lord, we come to Him with our burdens. And He gives us that opportunity always to lay these burdens before Him. So let us confess our failures, our fears, and our weaknesses to God. Let us seek God's mercy and grace that we may be forgiven and live in peace. God, who cares for all, we confess that we are by nature sinful and alienated from you. We do not always love you with our whole heart. We do not care for ourselves, our neighbors, our nation, or the earth as we ought. Forgive our failure to hear your word, our failure to worship you regularly, our failure to appreciate the great gifts of freedom Give you, give you this. And in our country, forgive our failure to care for the earth and its resources. Forgive our neglect of praying regularly for our world, our nation, and our elected leaders. Make us strong witnesses in word and action to your redeeming love in and through Jesus Christ. Amen. Almighty God in his mercy has given his son to die for us and for his sake forgives us all our sins. As a called and ordained servant of Christ and by his authority, I therefore forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We believe in Jesus our Savior. Therefore, through the water and word of holy baptism, God has made us his sons and daughters. With that promise, we live forgiven and free. Amen. You may be seated for the commentary. If you tried to describe what God is like, it could be difficult or daunting. But when the people who wrote the Bible pondered the mystery of God, they consistently described God's character in this way, compassionate and gracious slow to anger, overflowing with loyal love and faithfulness. We're going to look at this third phrase that God is slow to anger. Now, that might surprise some people. Isn't the God of the Bible mostly angry, striking people down for their sins? Well, it turns out that God's anger in the Bible is way more nuanced than that and way more interesting. In Hebrew, the phrase slow to anger is pronounced erek apayim, or literally long of nose. But what does God's patience have to do with a long nose? Well, first, we need to look at the common biblical Hebrew way to say that someone is angry. Their nose burned hot. Like in the story of Joseph, when Potiphar thinks that Joseph tried to sleep with his wife, his nose burned hot. It's usually translated, his anger burned. It's describing how your body, especially your face, gets hot when you're filled with anger. And so in Hebrew, the main words for anger are either nose or heat, or hot nose. This is why a patient person is called long of nose. It takes a long time for their nose to get hot. Like in the biblical proverb, a person's wisdom is their long nose. That is, their slow anger. Now in the Bible, God gets angry numerous times, but God doesn't have a nose or get hot. These are metaphors using our experience of hot anger to describe how God feels when he witnesses human evil. Just like you would get angry if you saw a child being bullied on the playground, so God gets angry when humans oppress each other and ruin his world. In the Bible, God's anger is an expression of his justice and his love for the world. But he's slow to anger, which means he gives people lots of time to change. Like in the story of the Exodus, when Pharaoh enslaves the Israelites and has their baby boys thrown into the waters, God sends Moses to confront Pharaoh. And Pharaoh's given 10 chances to let Israel go free. But after the 10th refusal, Pharaoh rides out with his chariots to destroy the Israelites. And so God destroys him in the waters. Pharaoh's own evil is turned back upon him. And we read that this is an act of God's hot anger. 
Now, that's really intense, but think about it. God wouldn't be good if he didn't get angry at Pharaoh's evil and eventually do something about it. And notice that God's anger is expressed by handing Pharaoh over to the consequences of his own decisions. And this is actually how God's anger is shown throughout the scriptures, like in the story of the Israelites. Over and over again, for hundreds of years, they betray the God who rescued them from slavery. And though he gives them many chances to turn around, they keep giving their allegiance to the gods of other nations. And each time we read that the hot anger of God burned against the Israelites. But notice what always follows. God gave them over into the hands of their enemies. Israel wanted to serve the gods of other nations, and so God, in his just anger, gives them what they want as those nations circle back and defeat Israel. This is similar to what the Apostle Paul says in his letter to the Romans. He says, God's anger is being revealed against human evil. And then three times he says what that looks like. God hands people over to their destructive desires and decisions, even if it leads to death. But Paul also says, God is patient, giving people time to come to their senses and change. Because remember, God's anger is a response to human evil, and it's based on a deeper character trait, his compassion and his loyal love. God is not content to let people sit in their own self-destruction. In the Bible, God's on a mission to rescue. This is why Jesus said that he was going to Jerusalem to die as a demonstration of God's love for his enemies. He would stand in the place of his people who were choosing self-destruction and take the consequences of their decisions upon himself. In Jesus' life, death and resurrection, we see God's anger at evil and his love for people working together to provide forgiveness and life for a humanity lost in self-ruin. So God's anger in the Bible is really important, but it's not the end of the story. When God is angry and brings justice, it's because he's good. And he's extremely patient, working out his plan to restore people to his love. And that's what it means to say that God is slow to anger. At this time, we enter into God's holy word. Can we read this point? The Old Testament reading comes from Isaiah 42, verses 18 through 25. Hear, you deaf, and look, you blind, that you may see. Who is blind but my servant, or deaf as my messenger whom I send? Who is blind as my dedicated one, or blind as the servant of the Lord? He sees many things, but does not observe them. His ears are open, but he does not hear. The Lord was pleased for his righteousness sake, to magnify his law and make it glorious. But this is a people plundered and looted. They are all of them trapped in holes and hidden in prisons. They have become plunder with none to rescue spoil with none to say, restore. Who among you will give ear to this, will attend and listen for the time to come? Who gave up Jacob to the looter and Israel to the plunderers? Was it not the Lord against whom we have sinned, in whose way we would not walk, and whose law they would not obey? So he poured on them the heat of his anger and the might of battle. It set him on fire all around, but he did not understand. It burned him up, but he did not take it to heart. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The New Testament reading comes from Romans 5, chapters, uh, verses 6 through 11. For while we were still weak, at the time, right time Christ died for the ungodly. For one will scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person one would dare even to die. But God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since therefore we have now been justified by his blood, much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. For if while we were enemies we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more, now that we are reconciled, shall we be saved by his life. More than that, we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. This is the word of the Lord. 
Thanks be to God. Please rise for the gospel acclamation. The Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew, the 27th chapter. Glory to you, Lord. Now at the feast, the governor was accustomed to release for the crowd any one prisoner whom they wanted. And they had then a notorious prisoner called Barabbas. So when they had gathered, Pilate, Pilate said to them, Whom do you want me to release for you, Barabbas or Jesus, who is called Christ? For he knew that it was out of envy that they had delivered him up. Then he released for them Barabbas, and having scourged Jesus, delivered him to be crucified. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Let us remain standing as we sing. Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, and God's people said, Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Um, when Pastor Scott called me and asked me to come in and kind of take care of things while he's partying down in San Antonio, uh, uh, I told him, I said, uh, what's going on? He goes, well, we got a series on the character of God. And I thought, oh, wow, I did one of those a few years ago. Uh, I says, oh. Uh, what do you got going on that? And he goes, oh, I got a video that goes along with it, you know. And I got these outlines that can kind of give you an idea of what's been happening thus far. And so, uh, and I said, well, do you have an outline for me? And he goes, no. <laughs> he says, you've been in ministry so long, you know, God probably told you this personally, you know. And I said, well, no, that's not really the case. But anyhow, I appreciate anything you give me. And so... Uh, he sent me a couple of lines, that was it, three lines, that I had to work with. 
And I'm going to use those three time, uh, lines 20 times, and that's going to be the sermon. You all will say amen. Say, Scott, the message was wonderful. <laughs> we finally understood it on the 20th time he said it, you know. Now, today, today we're going to talk about God's anger. In his exercise of his common grace, and when we say common grace, we're talking about God's grace for all of mankind. Uh, God displays an abundance, an abundance of patience and forbearance. So that's a nice word we don't use too much, but forbearance with the world. Uh, something that, that kind of really puts us back on our heels because sometimes we're not so patient, sometimes we're not so forbearing. Well, that patience, that forbearance of God is, is meant to lead men and women to repentance. Give them a chance to think about it and change their thoughts, okay? As we read the uh, Old Testament text, you know, it's got some of that stuff that most people don't like about the Old Testament. It, it's, it, it's showing God's wrath being exerted upon those who, well, would not walk in His ways or obey His commands. And in that text, there are some words that I think are very, very disturbing for all of us. He poured upon them the heat of His anger like they were just talking about in the, in, the, in the commentary. An anger that resulted in death, doom, and destruction. Did you notice how the cartoon was meant not to get anybody too scared? The shadow had the, the knife, and it came down, and the scene just changed right away. We know what that meant. God brought death, doom, and destruction on the people for not repenting. We also see that his anger is then without cause. It's not without cause. God gave them plenty of chances. He warned them over and over that would be consequences to their unrepentant hearts. Let's get serious for a moment, though. You have to admit it's pretty easy to get angry these days, right? Every time you go to the grocery store, You know you're old when you say things like, well, I can remember we could buy a loaf of bread down at H-E-B, three for a dollar. Or hamburger was 69 cents a pound. You know, we, we can sit there and look at our property taxes going up and up and up. And now that y'all who are sitting there going, hallelujah, they're going to be bringing all kinds of uh, 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 industry to, to uh, tailor and, and help this little community and then you get that tax bill. Your real estate doubled and so did the taxes. And you get a little bit upset, right? Now, when you think about it, God embedded his laws on our hearts. Whether you're a believer or not, God's law is embedded inside there. And so it, it sort of seems like it's a requirement that we should be filled with anger, you know, when things don't go according to his plan, much less our own plans. Because we get upset then too, right? Well, we point angry fingers then, don't we? It comes naturally. If you've ever had two children, and most of you probably did, Whenever things go wrong around the house, it's always, he did it, she made me. We point fingers. We really do have a whodunit view of life. But when we're the ones that are messing up, and how many of you messed up this week? Men, you have to automatically jack that hand up because we mess up a lot. We are so focused on one thing that we mess up six other ones right along the way, don't we? And we mess up. We don't want somebody pointing their fingers at us, being angry with us, especially a spouse. That's no fun at all. But just think about it. Receiving God's anger, His wrath, Thankfully, it isn't easy to get God mad. And that's the truth. And that's what we're talking about today. That's why it brings me to those words of St. Paul in the epistle. God shows his love for us that in while we were yet sinners, what Christ died for who? Us. He did. Now, that pretty much sums up the gospel message, the message of Jesus Christ our Lord. And God shows his love in us 
in those words. We're still sinners. Christ died for us. And why did Christ die for us? To gain for us the what? Forgiveness of sins. Now, uh, I don't know if y'all, how many of y'all own a thesaurus? It's not a dinosaur, it's a book. Pastors live in a thesaurus. They do, because we tend to repeat ourselves over and over. The old axiom, if you say it ten times, they'll finally get it. Well, you don't want to use the exact same word, so you're always looking for words that have the same meaning in it. And so when you look at God's love and you look at God's compassion in there, there are a whole bunch of words. Sympathy, charity, mercy, generosity, pity. And it goes on and on, and those words actually have alternatives to them. And so you could write a whole thesis on on the, the words that we can use to describe the love and the mercy and the compassion of God in Jesus Christ. But the words by themselves really don't, they don't really catch the fullness of God's love. In fact, I don't know if there really is anything. So by and large, we have that wonderful 316 verse that really gets to the heart of it. God so loved the world, what? That he gave his only son that, so with, uh, that whosoever believes in him shall not perish, but have what? Everlasting life. And for those of us who are on the countdown, I always joke about the early services are generally people checking in before they check out. You know, and that's the way it usually works. You know, and uh, the young ones are still trying to check in. You know, they always go to those services. Now, the only way we can really see God's love is, is to look at Jesus. I mean, he is God's love in the flesh, incarnated on sight. Okay? His love is being made real in his only begotten son. And so as we, we look through that New Testament and we you know, start at Matthew and go all the way through to Revelation, which is, it's going to be kind of confusing, he said, we look at descriptions of what it means that God loves us. And all we really need to do is look at those verses that have to do with Jesus. Jesus' words, Jesus' actions, the Apostle Paul and John and Peter, their reactions to Jesus and, and what he has done for us. And, and in the Revelation especially, the things that are yet to come in Jesus. Now, the Gospel lesson, is, is, it doesn't look like good news so much because it kind of cuts it off where Jesus gets, you know, killed gets crucified. But it does stay when Jesus had compassion. Can you imagine? That's why Good Friday to me uh, is so important. And the, one of the words, one of the seven words that Jesus speaks from the cross as he looks down on those who are gathered beneath him who are killing him, not trying to kill him, not planning to kill him, you know. They are killing him. He says, Father, forgive them. What? That's right. I always like it. Father, forgive them. They haven't got a clue. Because that's how we are. We are gathered there that day, and it's our sins that we're nailing him to the cross, and we didn't understand that even in our sin, you know, we should not be fearing because Jesus looks at us and he has had compassion on us. He sees it. You know, we don't really wake up in the morning and, and go down to Dairy Queen and meet with the guys or the gals, you know, and have, uh, have that free cup of coffee because you're over 65, you know, uh, and, and, and plan to be grossly sinful. We don't do that. During the day, isn't it right? Sin almost comes naturally. That's why in one of the confessions we have, we are by nature sinful and unclean. unclean. It just comes. And we don't like that about us. Oh, we may not say we're sorry at that point because we have to wrestle with our pride too. But when we have those silent moments on Sunday morning, those thoughts come flooding forward, asking God for his mercy in Jesus Christ. And as we said this morning, for his sake. When he had compassion of crowds, he was in reality showing the people that day and of this day what it means that God loves us. As he healed, as he forgave sins, as he brought people together, these are things he did. He displayed God's love. 
of forgiving, accepting, caring, and, and, and merciful, compassionate kind of love. A love which allowed God's only Son to be killed on the cross so that you and this guy standing in front of you might have eternal life. It's a reconciling type of love. Trying to seek how to bring peace to a bad situation. A love which brings people together, not separates them into little pigeonholes and boxes, you know. It's a love that's willing to sacrifice, to, to give in. To give in. How many people are governed by, well, that's not the point I'm trying to get at. We got a point. And we want to press that point. It's the point of a, a knife almost. Trying to get people to do it our way because we're pretty certain there's only two ways in life to do it. God's way or our way. And we're pretty sure our way is, should be number one. But we need to be willing to kind of give in sometimes. It's a love that's willing always to give instead of take. And that is only seen through Jesus Christ. And so Paul says, let love be genuine. Hate what is evil. Hold fast to what is good. Love one another with brotherly affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. He also says, be imitators of God. Imitators of God. Wow. As beloved children. Does God love you? You're a loved child of God. Act like it. Walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us. A fragrant offering, he says, a sacrifice to God. Sometimes we just need to sacrifice having our way. Because if we don't, we're always in some sort of contentious relationship that tears us apart, that destroys those the, the, the marriages, alienates children and siblings. It makes a nation destroy itself for an unwillingness to come together and work things out. There's a story of a group of men who were going across a, a desert. Uh, they were strangers. Some were well-to-do businessmen. Others were just common workers, you know. But one of them was a criminal. Well, as, as it, it, it happened, to happen, is, is a windstorm. Have you ever seen on, on, on television how these desert storms can come up and the sand gets all up in there? They're sitting there. They got their hoods over them to keep from getting blinded by the sand and stuff like that. And they're just creeping through the storm, moving forward and forward and forward. And finally, one of them looks around and there's one guy missing. The criminal. He's missing. Well, this one guy, one of the businessmen, sat there and said, well, I'm going to go out there and get him. And the other sat there and said, no, it's too risky. He's not worth it. He says, I'm going to get him. And so he leaves the others and he goes and search for this guy in this horrible sandstorm. Finally comes upon him. He's laying on the ground. He, he, he is almost dead, you know. And so what little water and food he had, he gives it to them to strengthen him up, puts him back up on his camel. And they lead and they go and they go forth. They finally catch up with the other guys. The other guys were astounded that they both showed up. They marvel at the kind of love he had for this criminal. His respect for someone that they felt was useless, worthless. Do you see yourself in that story? You know, I think I'm the criminal. That's where I see myself. You know, one thing about being a Lutheran is we have a tendency to go ahead and confess almost every Sunday that we are sinful and unclean. We know our reality. And we walk humbly before the Lord. We're not sitting there saying, well, you know, I'm really great because you know, God is excited to see me at church on Sunday morning. He can't start it without me. I am so good, you know. No, I'm with the criminal because I've broken God's laws. How many of you? Don't raise your hands. I'll just assume that you have. Maybe even right now as I'm saying these things. You never know. But God is the guy who turns around in Jesus Christ and goes out and looks for us. 
Have you ever felt like those evil people in the Old Testament? Do the things they did? Turn their backs on people in need? Take advantage of folks in, in their time of weakness? Have you ever thought poorly of an individual when you didn't the whole story? Didn't know the whole story? In business, did you maybe fudge a little bit? Or a whole lot? Have you taken gossip and inflated it and passed it on? Well, that's what God is seeing going on with those people over there. And these are destructive desires. These are destructive decisions being made. And He's not content for them just to self-destruct. But eventually, as the commentary put it very clearly, he lets them suffer the consequences of their own actions. The one part of that thing that I didn't even think about, which I thought was kind of cool, is, is that the nation of Israel began worshiping the gods, the ideologies of other nations and turned their back on him. It was sort of like when I worked in, in Arizona with uh, New Age cults and stuff like that, they always had that everything is a learning experience. There's no right, there's no wrong. It's kind of evolved since those days in the 90s. Now it's called woke. You know, we don't want to draw distinctions because it's all the same. It's monistic, monism. We seem to be following that a lot like that. But there will be consequences for such thinking. And we start to see those things. But instead of having compassion on people who are being misled and trying to give them the truth of God and leading them back into the fold of God's Word, we would just rather turn our backs on them, go run away from them, separate them, tell them to go over there. As bad as what the people were doing in that Old Testament lesson, as bad as we can be on something, the worst thing that we can do is to do nothing. To do nothing. To sit idly by while the devil and his minions guide us as a nation, as families, as communities into destruction. And that's why God draws us to come to this place. Because here is the place where transformation takes place. Okay? Having people in the body of Christ on earth transforms it. Their lives are changed. Here is where you know, they can encounter God and Christ through the Holy Spirit. Here, you and I, we, we can increase in our personal relationship with Jesus through the Word, through the sacraments we're about to partake, and through fellowship with one another, talking to each other, knowing each other, feeling out our, our feelings with one another. You know, here hurts are healed. Here lives are made whole. Here fellowship and love are present. And so this, this, this ability to be slow of, of anger comes by being transformed into the image of Jesus Christ through word and sacrament. And this is where Christ is present. Here is where compassion for people should be present. Not isolationism. We are called to proclaim through thought, word, and deed the love of God, which is slow of anger. Here's where God's love and forgiveness compels us to live like Jesus with others. Because we're family. I have this one little illustration before I close here. The story of a young girl and her mother. Mother was very beautiful. Beautiful, all except her hands, which were shriveled and scarred and honestly quite hideous. One day, the girl kind of put together enough courage to ask her mother about her hands. The mother told her the story of how their house had caught fire. And when she realized that her little baby girl was still inside there, she rushed in and grabbed her and hit her, but her hands were exposed. And so her hands were burnt horribly. 
They were able to save them. They did work, but they were hideous. The little girl started crying, and these are the words. Oh, mother, you know I've always loved you, especially your face, your smile, and your eyes. But better than all that, now I love your hands. Sometimes we need to do things that are so courageous for the needs of others that we do get scarred from it. Sacrifices are made. But that's the love of God that casts out his anger. God's anger is caused because of our evil human behavior. And evil happens when we sin against each other, when we oppress one another, when we choose the things, the people, and, and the ideologies of the world over God and His Word. God's plan and God's power are no longer plain for us to see because of this. Everybody's chasing after everything but Jesus. And that's why I think inside us we start, we start to fear that maybe evil is winning. And we start contemplating, is this the end times? Oh Lord, how long must we wait? We might even be tempted to take vengeance into our own hands. And instead of loving the hell out of people, beating the hell out of them. God warns us to trust Him. He says, Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave it to the wrath of God, for it is written, Vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. Justice will come. Good days are there before us, especially beyond the gates of heaven. Our God knows that while we are down here, He, he knows the wrongs need to be judged, and it's His job to make sure it takes place. In the exercise of His grace for all of mankind, as I began with, God displays an abundance of patience and forbearance with the world, with you and for me. That patience and forbearance ought to lead us to repentance. <clears throat> Never forget God saved us from His own wrath through His Son, rescuing us from being handed over to the death that we deserve for our sins. And we praise God here, for He truly is slow to anger and abounding in love. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. I invite you now to please stand as we affirm the basic teachings of our most holy faith. Together, I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and was made man and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried, and the third day he rose again, according to the scriptures, and ascended into heaven, and sits at the right hand of the Father. And he will come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead, whose kingdom will have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. And I believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. We pray. Heavenly Father, as we come before your throne this day, in the name of Jesus Christ, we are assured that you will not only hear, but that you will respond to our needs. This day, Heavenly Father, we thank you that you are so slow to anger, because Lord, as we, we take inventory of our own lives uh, and how we live according or not live according to your will, we are so thankful 
that your anger was not placed upon us, but upon your Son, Jesus Christ. It was His sacrifice, Lord, for us that brought us eternity. It was His sacrifice for us that brings us peace with you. Lord, in your mercy. Lord God, Heavenly Father, there is so much unrest and anger in the world around us, whether it be in our families, whether it be in our communities, our state, our nation, the world is filled with hate and anger. The wrath that it exerts, Lord, has never been productive because wars just create more wars. Lord, we ask that you send your Holy Spirit into the hearts of all people, especially us. Bring about a peace to understand that we need to sacrifice of ourselves for the needs of others, that their hearts might be changed from the evil that is guiding them now, the darkness in which they live, to the wonderful light of our Savior Jesus Christ and His truth. Give us the strength, Lord, to, to be little Christs, Christians, to the world around us, especially to our immediate families, the family of our, of our church, our community, and beyond. Lord, in your mercy. Bless our holy church, Lord, and remove from it the conflicts over dotted I's and cross T's. Forgive us our need to put our identity and a name on a sign instead of a cross in which Jesus hung. Let us be more ready to exemplify love than correction. Guiding people hand in hand to the Savior who loves them just as much as He loves us. Lord, in Your mercy. Lord, be with the politicians. For Lord, we know they tend to stretch the truth into lies. Let the truth be revealed what the intentions are of those who seek power, prestige, fame, honor. Turn them again to be servants of our nation. Lord, in your mercy. Be, be with those who serve in the, the military and all of our first responders. For Lord, they are willing to put themselves right on the edge for our needs. We especially thank all those from the district that came to help the folks up at Temple and, and uh, up in the Dallas area. We ask, Lord, that you be with all those who come to help people when chaos comes upon them. Bless them, their families, protect them from all harm. Lord, in your mercy. Today, we ask that you be with those in our congregation that are in need of your healing hand, of your comforting words of peace in troubled times. Be with Bonnie Winters and Vivian Enzer, Greg Ladner, Harold Kruger, Carlos Johnson, Donna Simpson, Debbie Annans. With those whose hearts are broken, be with, with Carolyn Bullock and, and family as they mourn the passing of Melanie Bullock. Be, Lord, with those who can't get out any longer, our, our shut-ins, and be with all the family and friends on our, our, our prayer list. Give them strength and hope, Lord, in the world to come, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection, and life everlasting. These things, Lord, we ask in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, who taught us all to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. At this time, I ask you to please be seated. As we gather our, our offerings this morning, uh, we'll be singing a, a, a tune right now, Praise and Thanksgiving, which uh, 
I like that Scott is, uh, is old enough to remember that tune, Morning Has Broken. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give him thanks and praise. It is good, right, on this day to give thanks to God the Father for the victory over death and the grave which he has granted us to us through his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. On this day, Christ destroyed the power of death for all who believe in him by his glorious resurrection from the dead. All the angels of heaven now sing his praise, the one who has been crowned the victor. All the saints of God who have gone before us now gather around his throne to worship him, adding their voices to those of the angels of God. We gather here today celebrating with all those who are in heaven the victory he has won for us made real. As we celebrate and receive the gifts of his body and blood, Therefore, with the angels and all the host of heaven, we lift our voices to praise his holy name. when he was betrayed, he took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it, and he gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, also after supper, he took the cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which has been shed for you for the forgiveness of sin. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. As often as we eat this bread and drink this cup, 
we proclaim the Lord's death until He comes. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. The peace of the Lord be with you always. As we prepare to receive these holy mysteries, we confess our sacramental understanding of what is before us. Together, I recognize and confess that I am a sinner. I repent of my sin and ask God's forgiveness. I believe that Jesus Christ is my only Lord and Savior from sin, Satan, and death. I believe that the risen Christ is really present in the sacrament and under the form of the bread and wine, I receive his true body and blood for the forgiveness of my sin and the strengthening of my faith and life. I resolve to dedicate my life to the service of my Lord in his body, the church, by regular group worship, cheerful giving, thankful living, and sharing the gospel with others. Dear friends in Christ, come, the table of the Lord is prayer, prepared.
Let us rise. We pray, Lord God, Heavenly Father, we thank you this day that in this Holy Supper you have given us the strength to move forward as people who have experienced your love and not your wrath. Let your spirit guide us in our dealings with others that we might reflect your will for them in their lives in a way that draws them closer to you. This we ask in Jesus' name, who lives with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. And God's people said, Amen. Amen. We sing our thanksgiving. you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with his favor and give you his everlasting peace. Amen. Amen. I invite you all to come. I have some extra verses that will help you uh, look at God's love and we can contemplate those over coffee and munchies in the fellowship hall over there. And uh, as we leave forth in this day, blessings to you and all that takes place this week. And may God encounter you with an opportunity to share his love with someone you don't like. <laughs> we sing. <laughs> <laughs>